people living with HIV in the world, with a huge percentage of them in Africa. Well, now another report is out, published by the Black AIDS Institute. It's trying to raise awareness about the AIDS epidemic right here at home. And it says AIDS in America today is a black disease. According to the report, as many as 30,000 new HIV infections occur among blacks each year. And this is startling. HIV AIDS, the leading cause of death among black women aged 25 to 34. Dr. Sanjay Gupta joins me now here in studio. I mean, this is incredible. We were saying just a minute earlier, I was live at a Harlem hospital on World AIDS Day a couple right. of years ago. They were talking about it back then. But now the numbers are there to back it up. Yeah, I mean, people sort of suspected what I'm about to tell you for some time now. But they have been actually researching this over the past few years to give you some of these numbers to really show you the disparity here. Let me point out a couple of things here. When you look at black in America and you look at AIDS overall, look at some of the numbers of, uh, regarding HIV specifically. First of all, the percentage is 19% Hispanic, 34% white, and this number, 47% black. The reason it's so staggering is that the, the African American population in this country, only 13%. So you get an idea of just how disparate this is. If you also start to break this down, 47% in the United States, look at some specific cities here. HIV cases in Washington, D.C., 80% of them are in African Americans. Go to Jackson, Mississippi, 84%. So the numbers are pretty staggering. What's even more remarkable is as, much, as staggering as those numbers are, Alina, if you have HIV as a black person in this country, you are two and a half times more likely to die of the disease. So you're more likely to get it, you're more likely to die of it. That's the problem. That's what's so shocking here. Well, and so that help obviously is so badly needed, which is why the Black AIDS Institute is coming out with this report. Uh, you know, 39 million Americans are black, half a million living with HIV right now. So how does that compare to other countries then? If you were to take African Americans and sort of make them their own country and compare them to the, the several countries around the world that get relief for emergencies, for AIDS relief, there's a program called PEPFAR, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. They look at 15 countries. The United States would actually stack right in the middle of those 15 countries that are getting emergency money. So, for example, they have more cases than Ethiopia, Rwanda, Botswana, Namibia. Uh, these, are, these are countries that, that qualify for, for this emergency money. It's $15 billion over five years. A lot of people say, look, that was great. It was great that so much money was given globally, but what about here at home? Yeah, the number of right. cases are greater than in so many of these other countries. Welcome to Pioneers in Healthcare. I'm Dr. Len Saputo. I'm board certified in internal medicine and have practiced for nearly 40 years here in the Diablo Valley. This show is about people who are special people who have made contributions to medicine that are unusual and outstanding. And today we have a special guest. His name is Dr. David Rasnick. He has a PhD in chemistry from Georgia Institute of Technology. He has 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical biotech industry. He has studied HIV AIDS since 1980, and he's a former president of Rethinking AIDS and the former president of the International Coalition for Medical Justice. He's a member of the Presidential AIDS Advisory Panel of South Africa, and he's worked closely with Peter Duesberg from UC Berkeley uh, on the aneuploidy theory of cancer, which we'll do on another day. He also was a senior researcher with Dr. Matthias Rath at the Health Foundation in Africa. He has a book out that's called Germ of Lies, which you can find on lulu.com. David, it's wonderful to have you here. It's such a privilege to be working with you today. It's a pleasure to be with you. We have kind of a long and interesting history because you're a researcher. You've been involved in the pit, okay, where the information comes out that tells the clinicians, the doctors, what's a fact and what's not a fact. And things have gotten all bungled up. 
And here we are now with a lot of different ideas about what HIV and AIDS mean. And maybe that's a good place to start. You know, people kind of make the assumption of HIV and AIDS. And, it, and there's a lot of controversy about whether or not that's true. What is HIV? HIV is a retrovirus. It's one of uh, at least three or 4,000 that have been cataloged. And it would be the first retrovirus to cause disease if it were true that it caused any disease at all. So there's never been a retrovirus that's been known to cause a single disease in the history of medicine. That's true. And HIV, I'm among uh, many other scientists around the world, probably several thousand, that have concluded, based on the evidence, that HIV is completely harmless and it certainly does not cause AIDS or anything else. So you're saying it's much like a PSA might be in prostate cancer? where the PSA goes up, but there's no point treating the PSA because the problem is it's a cancer someplace. It's worse it, than that. Okay. <laughs> it's totally worse than that. HIV has never been obtained from a human being. People should understand that. Retrovirus... Never been cultured from a human being. Never been obtained from a human what being. What does that mean? For example, like uh, if you have hepatitis or, or uh, flu or, or a cold or measles or sure. chicken pox, any viral disease, you can take a sample of blood or at least from the, the, the wound or the pox. Uh, you can culture you it. Can, don't even have to culture it. There's a virus there that you can quantify without even culturing. You can culture it, mm -hmm. but typically you can spin it in a centrifuge and get a, a, a little bit of it in a vial and you can quantify it. It will be an uh, infectious, viable virus that you got directly from the patient. If you put it into another human being, that will infect the other human being. That has never been done with HIV. That's just really hard to believe. I mean, that's some of Koch's postulates. I mean, that's who's the guy who was the infectious disease, father of infectious diseases, yeah. who says you have to do that to prove that actually a disease is caused by a particular organism. Well, HIV led the bandwagon where you can basically uh, invent something out of thin air and turn it into a multi-billion dollar, uh, hundreds of billion dollars industry. Another example would be the uh, hepatitis C, which is even acknowledged by Chiron, which used to exist, the company that made the original hepatitis C test, that they never ever actually obtained hepatitis C. They just got bits and pieces of it and then inferred what this virus must be. And people to this day are being tested for something that has never ever been obtained from a human being. Now, is there an association between people who are HIV positive and tend to get AIDS? Yes, it's uh, an association uh, by definition. Okay. In fact, you cannot get AIDS uh, uh, by definition unless you have antibodies to HIV. So you can find the antibodies to HIV virus. Does that, does that mean that the virus is there if you can make an antibody against it? Uh, no, it does not. In fact, the presence of the antibody, uh, that's the principle of, of immunization. It means that your immune system is won out and it's defeated the, the pathogen, uh. the virus, and it's gone. That's, a, uh, for example, if you've ever had uh, measles or right. chicken pox, you will have antibodies to it, but the virus is not detectable. So when somebody has something like mumps or measles or chicken pox, uh, and they have antibodies, the, the illness is done. Exactly. They don't have the antibodies when they're sick. And that's exactly the situation you're saying about HIV and AIDS. That's right. They generate it over time, and that's how they defeat, defeat the viral infection. But it's even worse than that. The inserts that come with the antibody test for HIV ex uh, say explicitly in there that they have no reference standard to determine whether or not the antibodies that, that they detect positive in the test actually have anything to do with HIV. They don't even know if those antibodies are really from HIV because they have no reference standard. Well, how did we ever get to a situation then? This is not making any sense. How could a logical physician or uh, the whole medical profession come to the conclusions based on no evidence? Or is that probably a question you want to ask me? I don't well, know. Well, I mean, I've asked myself that too uh -huh. because when I was a young scientist in my early 30s, back in 1980, when this whole AIDS thing uh, uh, popped up, yeah. uh, I was eager to get on to it, work on it like every other scientist that I knew. It was such a bizarre thing. You know, it was a, all these weird diseases I'd never heard of in my life were, were occurring, popping up exclusively in gay men. I mean, that, that's strange. I thought it was my Andromeda strain, you know, <laughs> at the time, and I wanted to work on it. But uh, I learned uh, years later that the Centers for Disease Control had actually accurately figured out what AIDS was as early as 1982 they had discovered that it was a drug disease, that the, the, the reason that these AIDS diseases, these immune deficiency diseases and other diseases were the uh, uh, direct result of chronic use of recreational drugs, amphetamines, uh, poppers, uh, uh, heroin, cocaine, and things like that. Okay. How that changed 
was by decree at a press conference on April 23rd. By decree? By decree. <laughs> an, uh, uh, There's a scientific approach. I, the king, now say it's this way, so therefore it is? Yes. Is that what I, you're saying? I remember it very distinctly because, remember, I was a scientist eager to know. I'd spent about four years wondering how I could apply my talents as a scientist to work on AIDS. But nobody really understood in the, in the scientific world what was causing AIDS. And then on April 23rd, 1984, Margaret Heckler, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, brought out uh, Robert Gallo of the National Cancer uh, Institute and uh, uh, said that he had discovered the probable cause of AIDS. The very next day, they deleted the word probable. Uh, uh, and Robert, it became a fact. It became a fact. Robert Gallo applied for a patent on his HIV test that very day. Ah. The federal government got behind it. Now the federal government, we taxpayers, as of this year, because of the latest legislation for the PEPFAR program, which w had just uh, uh, voted in another $48 billion for African AIDS, we have now spent to uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars, $250 billion on AIDS. American taxpayers have just not the drug companies, not volunteer organizations, but the federal government has, has spent this money. Wow. And they have not saved the first AIDS patient. They use that fact to advertise more money to do AIDS research and to warn people about uh, uh, safe sex and condoms and things. Okay, now people are talking, and one of the things I know you know a lot about is, is the infectiousness right. of this disease. Right, it supposedly. Is, well, <laughs> that's what everybody says. You turn right. on the television set and you start hearing people talking about AIDS, and what they're talking about is be sure you have a condom, uh, right. make sure that you're... You Sexual know, transmission. Yeah, it's an STD. Right. And what does the data actually show? Is it? Well, the first thing, uh, the data is clear on, absolutely, totally clear, is that retroviruses, remember HIV is a retrovirus, are not sexually transmitted. Even if it caused AIDS, it is not sexually transmitted. Uh, scientists have known this for, well, I guess, 50 years. You can fingerprint and mix a bunch of lab rats together, and this, this brand has a certain it's uh, endogenous retroviruses. Right. This one does. You mix them together. They do not transmit them sexually to each other. You can take them out. And you can identify what strain of rat they are by their, by their spectrum of retroviruses because they goodness. don't get mixed. My goodness. And the same is true with human beings. No study has ever shown, even with HIV or SIV, the so-called simian Simian. immunodeficiency virus, no laboratory experiment has ever demonstrated sexual transmission of a retrovirus, including HIV or any of its laboratory equivalents. Well, then where did the whole medical profession get the idea that this is an STD? Where does, how does, I mean, you shouldn't have to answer that, but I'm, you probably know the answer. Well, uh, it took me a while because you see, well, again, uh, it's, we have a quarter century now uh, of this stuff. And I started out being sure. as mainstream as you can get. Yeah. I made uh, or, uh, organic chemist by training, and I've worked in arthritis, emphysema, parasites, cancer, and then AIDS. And I, so I thought, well, all I need is, is the target. You know, now we have a virus, and I know viruses have enzymes, and I try to make inhibitors for these enzymes. And then over the course of my uh, being a scientist and being confronted with the contradictions of the, of the results of the research data, you have to scratch your head and you say, wait a minute, retroviruses are not uh, sexually transmissible. Uh, nobody's ever obtained uh, a viable sample, infectious, free, infectious HIV from a human being. What's going on here? And it was clearly by certainly 1985, all up to 87 for sure, that AIDS itself was not a contagious disease. It stayed within uh, the, the same risk groups. It was eight out of nine AIDS cases to this day are still male, and 60% are gay men. So an infectious How disease shouldn't happen? be able to discriminate between one person and another. There, there's no virus that knows whether you're white or black, <laughs> gay or straight, r rich or poor, or what zip code you live in, except HIV, apparently. Would you have any idea why the CDC is saying that this is an STD? and that we should be careful, it's a sexually transmitted disease? Uh, this is area for speculation, because, <laughs> well, because there is no, there's no documentation, whatever. there's no study that shows that AIDS, even AIDS itself, is sexually transmitted. In fact, there's all of the studies that tried to quantify the uh, uh, efficiency of sexual transmission of HIV, by the way, have never succeeded in even coming up with an estimate that they could base it, that was based on scientific data, zero. In fact, the largest, a control study, uh, Nancy Padian, it was done I think in 1996, American Journal of Epidemiology, it was published in, showed it was a 10-year study, it was the largest of its kind. Not a single one of the 
uh, there were th these discordant uh, couples. One was HIV positive, one was HIV negative. And, they, and uh, many of them, probably most of them, I don't remember the exact numbers, did not use condoms or anything during the course of this study. Not a single HIV sexual uh, partner, HIV negative sexual partner, became HIV positive during this. Nobody has ever demonstrated that an HIV negative person becomes HIV positive via sexual intercourse. That's just shocking. It is. And, and yet the physicians, okay, I, I have to say that I feel very sorry for physicians. These are people trying to do the right thing. They're good people. They're clinicians. But they're not scientists. And they depend on the literature that's being published. And they also listen to the kinds of documents that come out of CDC and FDA about what's right and what's not right. How are, how are we going to help those people to understand something in a different sort of way that gets the truth out there? Well, money has killed the whole scientific uh, uh, process. For my, I'm a scientist, and over my 30-some-odd years of being a professional scientist, I've watched it go from being one of the most democratic activities on this planet, far more democratic than any regular and lots political. lots of integrity. You lots of to integrity, the right stuff. really good people. It didn't matter who you were. You know, it's what you did and your integrity that you, you brought to this. I've watched that evaporate over the years. And the place where it's, it's fallen apart the worst is the United States. Unfortunately, Europe has resisted, but they're caving in now and becoming more and more like the, uh, like the American. Thing. You know, before you go on with this, mm -hmm. I want to just substantiate what Dr. Rasnick is saying. He's saying that the literature that we have, the medical literature, the scientific literature, is no longer believable. And it's not just him saying it. Marcia Angel, who was a physician and chief editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, Catherine DeAngelis of the Journal of the American Medical Association, Ushma Anil of another major medical journal, have all quit their jobs and said they, they are disappointed, disillusioned, and can't believe the low quality of material that's coming across their desk that's published in their journals. And it's because of other factors. There are people who have an ax to grind, who have a mission to accomplish, who have an ulterior motive to be able to uh, get their point across. So if a pharmaceutical company, for example, is doing a study, they're going to make it look the best they can. They're not going to invest half a billion dollars, okay, in a, in a study and come out and say, don't buy our drug, it sucks. So we're seeing a lot of it. So what you're saying is no more than a reflection of what they are saying. And you've personally experienced that. Yeah, and more and more uh, people are. The main, even, it is such an obvious problem now that many of the mainstream people are, are speaking out. Even the physicians are beginning to question yeah, it. And look at the direct-to-consumer ads and all the problems that yeah, come with that. Right. Big deal. But I want to take this back mm -hmm. to uh, this whole subject of AIDS mm -hmm. now. We mm -hmm. talked a little about HIV, the mm -hmm. test, and mm -hmm. some of the reasons why things are like they are. Um, tell us what AIDS is. I mean, it's it stands for the letters A I D S stand for acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Okay. There, uh, this acquired immune deficiency syndrome has been known long before what we call AIDS with the capital A I D S. Mm -hmm. It was principally in people who uh, were uh, malnourished or premature babies. For example, uh, there was good examples of this during after World War II when the Allies went in and they looked in Germany and they saw the oh, yeah. consequences of malnutrition. Sure. And AIDS popped up among among these young these children especially and even some adults just mal malnutrition. In fact, malnutrition is the world's leading cause of acquired immune deficiency. Well, that shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, it, it's it no, makes it's sense. It's no surprise. If you don't have enough of the nutrients you need to take in, your immune system is going to go south. It can't do the job it's supposed to. So you've got an acquired immune deficiency syndrome. That's and right. the problem is, is the word AIDS is more charged. Right. People don't think what AIDS stands for. Right. They just think it's this horrible disease that, that happens because of HIV and in gay men and drug users. And sexually transmitted. Right. The, in the industrialized world, the uh, principal causes of acquired immune deficiency is uh, a drug treatment, chemotherapy for cancer, for example, and also uh, drug therapy like cyclosporine A for, drug, for uh, organ transplant patients. Okay. The cyclosporine A is So we're trying to, to interfere with immune competence. With, with the organ transplant drugs. Yes. You intentionally depress the immune system so that the pace, patient doesn't lose the liver or the kidney. Exactly. Or whatever. But you have to titrate it, you know, mm -hmm. or they'll get sick with AIDS or diseases. Or you might kill them. You kill them. You kill them with it. 
Uh, so those were the principal sources of AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome around the world. Okay. Recreational drugs. Peter Duisberg and I have documented over the past hundred years that chronic use of heroin and cocaine and amphetamines and the, ni the poppers, the nitrite inhalants that the gay men use almost exclusively, uh, can cause AIDS-defining diseases. Okay. And that's, that explains principally why the gay men, for example, were so disproportionately uh, among the, the gay uh, statistics. So all you're saying is that these people with these kinds of lifestyles have immune deficiency problems. That's right. And it's acquired. Right. Okay, so it's AIDS. Right. And the CDC understood this as early as 1982. They mm -hmm. actually had it figured out. It wasn't rocket science. All this stuff is, is known. Mm -hmm. But then after that press conference, Robert Gallo was the one you know, who said that uh, his retrovirus, and then he was the one that said it probably came from Africa, <laughs> and it's probably sexually transmitted. He's a retrovirologist. He should know better that... Yeah, that, that's by that, decree again. That by decree that retroviruses are not sexually transmitted. They're not. And even if they were, they're totally harmless. So he had a lot to gain from this. He did. He made, he made he a lot of money. a millionaire. Yeah, uh, on at least HIV test, there. At least, yeah. So the HIV test, and then he takes a stand against anybody who has an argument against that by decree again. But he was quietly pushed out of the NIH in the, uh, uh, in the early 90s because of a, uh, some very controversial work. In fact, he was convicted of scientific misconduct uh, for basically uh, stealing uh, the retrovirus that we call HIV from Luc Montagnier. Frenchman. Right. And then uh, the, I believe it was the Reagan administration that came in and said, no, no, we can't have um, uh, our big discoverer of the cause of AIDS being convicted. So they changed the rules, <laughs> you know, and then throughout the conviction, but quietly they forced him out. So you hardly ever hear anything from Robert Gallo anymore. That's right. You know. Now we talk about treating acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. Mm -hmm with drugs that are very toxic. Right, the chemotherapy for cancer, basically. It's, it's so it's doing more to suppress the immune system. It does, and they're extremely toxic drugs. There's not, there's not an HIV drug on the market that does not come with a black box warning label. That's the most serious warning that the FDA puts in a label before they pull the drug off the market. Could it be that somehow, for reasons we don't understand, that the drugs are used, like AZT and others, uh, to treat people with AIDS, have a beneficial effect on them on their disease in some way is that possible it's always possible uh, for that to happen I, is it probable <laughs> i mean the, the can whole we explain it would be a better way to say right it. can we explain it uh you probably can but what is really clear in the literature is is that these drugs in mass on the large numbers of people you know 95 90 95 percent of the people for sure do worse on these drugs than people who don't take them. How do you know that? It's in the mainstream literature itself. So you can quote the articles that say that. Why don't the doctors look at that? Or is that your the question? Doc <laughs> MDs, MDs, basically, physicians, practitioners, do not read the scientific literature. So they're basically following CDC recommendations. Not yeah, That's true. Uh, but they also, you know how they learn about drugs, the pharmaceuticals? They learn about the drugs from the, <laughs> the, drug, the, company. the, the drug salesman. <laughs> that's right. That a lot sends of the time that's true. You know, they that's don't read the, the primary literature on, on this stuff. Well, don't include me and they. <laughs> no, absolutely not. That's why we're here. That's right. It's because you are not a they. <laughs> All right, so, so these drugs then that are using to treat immune deficiency are actually causing it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they weren't actually designed to treat immune deficiency. They were designed to kill HIV. Okay, that's right. what I meant by that. Right. Okay. Assuming that HIV is destroying the, Im the immune system. However, uh, as you mentioned, AZT, DDI, 3TC, D4D, yeah, yeah. and all these other uh, nucleoside analogs were developed in the 1960s as chemotherapy for cancer. The chemotherapy for cancer. Mm -hmm. No physician would uh, prescribe cancer chemotherapy for the lifetime of the patient. They would be taking up on charges for malpractice because the chemo will kill the patient if they stay on it for life. For the life. Right. But yet, if you're HIV positive, if you happen to have antibodies that react on the Abbott Laboratories test or whatever, and you're called HIV positive, the standard of care is now to give you these drugs for life. Wow. And these drugs can kill you. In fact, they do kill you. And since, I think, the late 1990s, the leading cause of death among HIV positive Americans is liver failure. Right. Due to caused the, by the drug. Caused by these drugs. And now, since again, the, about the, the mid-1990s, there's a new problem. The, the, the AIDS establishment is sweeping this under the rug and they're giving it a new name. They're calling it 
IRS for <laughs> immune reconstitution syndrome. That's or, as bad as IRS Internal yeah, Revenue Service. Yeah, that's, that's easy to remember. <laughs> and right. it's, these drugs are causing exactly the same AIDS-defining diseases that the CDC came up with in their clinical definition of AIDS. What makes them called I IRS or immune reconstitution syndrome and not AIDS is because these diseases now only pop up after people start taking the antiretroviral drugs on weeks to months. Wow. They're exactly the same diseases as AIDS, so they're, instead of calling them drug-induced AIDS, they're called immune reconstitution syndrome. Well, that's sweet. That just avoids And it's a huge, huge literature on this now, and whole conferences are devoted to this problem. Now, this is interesting because maybe most of the doctors don't read the medical literature. Uh, and and do it mm -hmm. seriously, mm -hmm. and they and they do kind of what everybody else in the profession recommends because those are the standards of practice in a community. But the pharmaceutical companies know this. Yes, they do because they make the information up. So does the, the NIH CDC the must know it. They do. Okay, and yet they're they're perpetuating this myth. Right. Anyway. Well, okay. You know why it has to continue? I think I do, but well, you say but it. I'll <laughs> say. It. All, all a person has to do is imagine. Just imagine that what we are talking about here is true, yeah. that AIDS is not contagious, it's not sexually transmitted, it's not caused by HIV, the, the anti-HIV drugs are killing people and causing AIDS-defining diseases, wow. and, and on top of that, there's no such thing as an AIDS epidemic in Africa, and we can talk about that. That's, another, like subject, that's, yeah. an, that's another subject entirely. Now, if all of that is true, we spent a quarter of a trillion dollars on this bogus blunder, this biggest scientific medical mistake th of, of all time. The germ of lies, huh? The germ of lies. The title of your book. Right. Then what is the likelihood that the directors of the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Secretary of Health and Human Services, or any president in the United States is going to say, whoops, folks, sorry, we made a mistake. Yeah, right. What is the likelihood of that happening now? Well, I guess it's not too good because it hasn't. <laughs> the CDC, actually, when Peter Duisberg had his article back in 1987, in cancer research where he critiqued the whole thing about retroviruses in general, HIV in particular, and how they could not cause any disease. The CDC, Peter was able to lay his hands on an internal memo that was going around that said if this got out and the public knew about it, nobody would ever believe us again. Right. That's it. That's basically it. It's not even about money anymore, really. It's about face saving. It's about the whole uh, infrastructure or edifice of the health care system in the United States, possibly the whole institutional form of government. Would, would be seriously undermined by the fact that this huge quarter trillion dollar mistake was allowed to happen and it's, per, and it's continuing to happen and the people a, in the government know it. They but absolutely know it. There's also got to be pressure too because from the point of view of the pharmaceutical industry we know the hold that they have on the FDA, mm -hmm. on the Congress uh, because they've got a lot of money and they have more lobbyists than anybody, any, any com um, companies in the world and so they can buy their way out of a lot of this I think they will come out of it clean. You know yeah. why? They're just going to the next disease, the next drug. It's the federal government is really keeping this alive. It's not the drug company. Because okay. they have their institutions that they have to consider. We've only got a couple minutes left, mm -hmm. and I want two subjects I still want to cover. One is the HIV kids. Yeah. Okay? These right. are kids that are HIV positive. Right. They're healthy. Yeah. If the parent won't follow the advice of the doctor and give them the AZT drug, mm -hmm. Child Protective Services comes in and says, we're going to take the kid away from you. Yeah. What's, what do you think of that? Uh, it's horrible. I've, I've been involved in a number of these cases on the side of the parents trying to keep their kids from being taken away and being poisoned on these drugs. And I've known a number of cases over since the 90s that I've been personally involved in well, on a legal basis. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. These children and parents have absolutely no civil rights when it comes to health care. And that is an abomination, and I hope that these court cases, we, we need to put these things on trial. We need to take a lawsuit or make a lawsuits against uh, GlaxoWelcome, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, and these other places that are killing people with these drugs. Right. To public, basically, not, not so much that I want to hurt them, which I don't care about that though, one way or the other, but it's got to be publicized somehow, and the best place to do it is in the courtroom. And that's where the data you can bring from the studies that have been done that are in the scientific literature that show all the things that you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Because they're a matter of public record. Absolutely. Now, it's easy to come by if you want, really want it. Okay, so now if somebody is HIV positive and uh, you want to do, if, if you're going to do anything for somebody that's like that, you would pr probably propose doing nothing. But yeah. if somebody comes to you that, and they have even acquired immune deficiency syndrome, they have AIDS, 
How would you propose treating them? You use lifestyle uh, things? You support them? I mean, I'm not, I tell you what, we I don't have, do. we've only got about a minute or two left. Sorry, sorry. I don't know how you're going to do that. I'm not a physician. But I, I know one thing. I would but not, you know a lot about I, this. I know a lot about this. I would not. I would treat symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, if it's malnutrition, feed people. That's what yeah. we did in South Africa. It works like magic. It's right. amazing. They get better really right before your eyes almost. Uh, you don't treat them with toxic drugs. You don't. I would tell people. I, I'll even make it even more blunt. We need to outlaw the HIV test. We need to outlaw these tests. They do. They're horrible. They kill people. The tests kill people because then they go on and they take the drugs and the drugs ki kill the people. Nobody, I'd adv I would say nobody should take an HIV test. They should refuse every opportunity or any pressure to take an HIV test out there. Can anybody force you to take an HIV test? Uh, you can if you're in jail, for example. They and they've tried to make, uh, I, in some states they force, it's on a state-by-state -state basis. And um, the, um, uh, anybody who's ever had an HIV test, totally forget about it. Erase it out of your mind if, you, if possible. Now, if you can't, then the, uh, the HIV test is so unstable that it, it, the result depends on what day you take it on, where you go, even, and who looks at it. It's totally arbitrary. So it might be negative one day and positive another. Exactly. So if you're positive and you really, really want a negative, just keep taking test after test until you get the negative, <laughs> and then use that, that result. Okay. So maybe that's the thing to do for parents who have HIV-positive kids who are doing well. And what you're saying, basically, if I understand it right, is look at the disease. Don't look at the label that's put on it. Exactly. And then do what you can to support that illness, doing the safest things you can that are it's possible. Safe. Not and the, at lifestyle first. Yes. Get the healthy diet. Do exercise. Right. Do the kinds of things that, that you can do to, to keep people to get enough rest. Reduce the stress in their life. Keep their weight down. Make sure they have a meaningful purpose in their life. We do all those things that doesn't work, then we move on to things that are a little bit more aggressive, but certainly not thinking about using anti-cancer drugs for a disease that's been fabricated and probably doesn't even exist. That's, that's the position you would take. Absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> it's such a privilege to have you on this show, David. Thank you so much for, for well, being here today. Uh, there are not too many people who have the courage that you do to have stuck out uh, for so many years in, a, in an area where the public is not really receptive to hearing what you're saying and, and physicians get angry with you. I've tried to put together a couple of AIDS conferences, which you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. that include you and Peter Dewsbury and have invited physicians to be there and have had no luck at getting one physician to face you or Peter. That tells me something. It means that some of what you're saying has to be true and that the doctors know that they and, do they, know and they don't want to be involved in a position that's going to get them in trouble with their medical board or their colleagues. You pay a serious price to speak out on this. It's cost me, it's cost Peter. You know this well. It could cost anybody. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you, David. I've enjoyed it.